I want to introduce the individuals who are going to react to the presentation that you're about to hear, and I'm going to call them up one by one. First, Neil Howe, come on up, uh, arguably the country's most renowned authority on this younger generation, as well as on the generations uh, that preceded it. Uh, with the late Bill Strauss, Neil co-authored a series of groundbreaking books on American generations. They first identified the cohort that we're examining today with the book Millennials Rising, and that was 10 years ago. David Campbell, please come up. Where are you, David? There you are. Hi. Uh, Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Notre Dame and the author or co-author or editor of a number of books on civic engagement, on religion, in politics, and on voting behavior, as well as a book that he and Robert Putnam will publish this fall, examining the religious landscape in the United States. Mark Lopez, where are you, Mark? Right here. Associate Director of the Pew Hispanic Center, a project uh, of the Pew Research Center, formerly an assistant professor at the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. Uh, Mark was also research director there for the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement, also known as CIRCLE. Allison Pond, right here, uh, research associate for the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, another project of the Pew Research Center. Uh, before taking on this assignment, Allison worked for the International and Government Affairs Office of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She also worked for the National Crime Prevention Council. And finally, I'm going to introduce the person who's going to lead off this panel with fresh off the press's survey results, Paul Taylor, Executive Vice President of the Pew Research Center. Paul heads the Center's Social and Demographic Trends Project, as well as the Pew Hispanic Center. Paul spent 25 years, this is the most important part of his life, as a newspaper reporter. Um, and he is still remembered as one of the very best the Washington Post has ever produced. After Paul finishes, we are going to spend about 45 minutes hearing from the panel. Then we're going to take questions from you in the audience for another 30. Paul Taylor, you are on. Thank you, Judy. Uh, thank you, Andy. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, uh, we call this report Confident, Connected, and Open to Change. And over the next few minutes, I'm going to try to tell you why we chose those words. I'm going to offer a very fast tour of a very broad landscape. This is a sprawling report. We covered a lot of areas. I'm going to drive too fast. I'm going to throw a lot of numbers at you. Numbers are the lingua franca of the Pew Research Center. I'm not going to pause much to discuss what they mean. That's for the rest of the panelists, uh, in this morning panel and the rest of the panelists throughout the day. And I hope all of you, I know Judy very much wants to get the audience involved. Uh, so uh, let's go. Before you get started, I just want to say if any of you at the far end over there want to get a better view, there are some couple of empty tables over here, so feel free to, to make you, your yeah, way over. I, I don't know. Should I move out slightly? Yeah. Um, this, this is... Back. Go ahead. I'm going to move this back. This is the most diverse generation racially and ethnically in our history. I think most of us recognize that. We are in the, we are in the period of enormous uh, change. The face of America is changing. By middle of the century, uh, we, will be, we will no longer be a, man, a majority white country. Uh, Hispanics are the biggest driver of that change. Uh, in this generation, they account for uh, 19 percent, but uh, I they're only the leading edge of a much bigger demographic bulge. One quarter of all children born in the United States today is Hispanic. Never before in our history has a single minority ethnic group made up this largest share uh, of our young population. Um, most people associate Hispanic with immigrant, and indeed the Hispanic presence is, is a result of one of the great immigration waves in our history. It's different from the previous two. They were European. This immigration wave is now about 40 years old. Half of it is Hispanic, a quarter of it is Asian, and the remainder is Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. But interestingly about this generation, this generation is not predominantly immigrant. Gen X, the next up generation, has more immigrants in it than this generation does. Because this immigration wave is 40 years old, this generation is primarily the children of immigrants. And we did a big report about how young Latinos are growing up. Mark Lopez co-authored it. He'll be talking some about that. Uh, this generation, like all Americans, but particularly this generation, has been hammered by this recession. Uh, I won't go through all these numbers there, but we, 
in the first report we did with Judy, we asked them if you are employed full time, uh, and 50% uh, said yes, now it's down to 41%. Another way we can express those figures is through the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, we looked at how many uh, 18 to 29 year olds uh, are, either, uh, are either unemployed or not in the workforce. And what we find is that 37% of this generation today is either unemployed or not in the workforce. This is the highest share for this age group in nearly 40 years. The last time it was this high, and this is of interest, uh, was 1972. 1972, some bad economic times. It also happened to be the last year that we had a military draft in this country, and there were a lot of young adults who wanted to stay out of the workforce because they wanted to stay out of, out of harm's way, literally and figuratively. Let me take a little detour from the economics to talk a little bit about, about military service. This generation has grown up in a decade when, the, when, when our country has been fighting two wars, and yet uh, it has far less exposure uh, to military service and all the responsibilities and the burdens that bear, that implies, than any previous generation in American history. Of this generation, today, 2% of the males in this generation, 18 to 29, are military veterans. If you look at the Xers, one generation up, same stage of life, 6% were military veterans of males. The Boomers, same stage of life, 13% were military veterans. The silent generation, 24% were military veterans. So a profound shift here in, in one of the classic pathways to adulthood. As long as we're on this detour, another important institution where there has been a profound shift is religion. One quarter of this generation, if you ask them their religion, they say, I'm not affiliated. I, you know, I have no formal association with religion. Uh, that is unprecedented I I since we've been able to take this polling. It's about half the share of their parents' generation, the boomers, at the same stage of life. Now, we know most, many people typically become more religious over time, and we will also add, and Alison Pond of the Forum will talk about this, and perhaps David as well, not, not belonging does not necessarily mean not believing, and if you look at, at, at various practices, uh, daily prayer, spirituality, and other things, actually this generation is not that dissimilar. But let's return to the economic story uh, because uh, it, it is a, it's a very profound one. As I said earlier, uh, uh, this is the most unemployed or out of the workforce generation in modern history. Um, there is a positive side to this coin, and it's almost a, it's o there's almost a seesaw here. Most out of the workforce, they are also uh, the, the most engaged in college, community college or graduate schools. A, the highest share in modern history of 18 to 24 year olds in this case, because that's the classic college going age, a higher share than ever before are now enrolled in college. It's, it, it's a tick under 40 percent, never been this high. Some of this is classic long-term long -term change. A modern knowledge-based economy sends a message to everybody, you want to get ahead, uh, you better get some credentials. But that trend has been clearly accelerated in the last few years by the recession. Can't find a job anyway, might as well go get a degree or another degree. And we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of that. What is striking uh, about this is that despite this situation, um, this is a generation that is very confident about its economic future. Uh, we all sort of know, uh, any, any of us who have had teenagers or some of us once actually were teenagers. We know that teenagers and 20-somethings tend to think they're invincible, everything is going to work out fine. We see that in a lot of polling data over time. But for this generation to be this detached or this unable to find the first rung on the economic ladder, we asked them a series of questions that we have asked over the years. Do you, you currently have enough money to lead the life you want to lead, or do you think you will have enough money eventually to lead the life you want to lead? Nine in 10 of this generation say, yes, I'm going to eventually have enough money, or I already do. They are much more optimistic about their own economic futures than older adults are about their economic futures, the older adults who are worried about their 401ks or worried about their retirement, et cetera. On top of that, they're also feeling more upbeat about the country as a whole. Um, a classic uh, question that pollsters have been asking since the beginning of time is, uh, you know, uh, how are things going in the country today? You, you satisfied or not with the way things are going in America? And there's a line chart that shows on top, it's the younger generation, and you'll see over 20 years, it, it's always a little bit more optimistic on that question than are those 30 and over. But the gap is now the biggest that we have seen it uh, in, in the 20 years that we've been asking this question. 
So whatever toll on the national psyche that the current circumstances have taken, you've got a recession, you've got a jobless recovery, you've got a financial meltdown, you've got a housing uh, meltdown <laughs> in terms of values, and you've got two wars, it has left a much bigger dent on older adults than it has on, on younger adults. Okay, they are a connected generation, and th th this almost goes without saying, but we asked uh, people of all ages in this survey, do you think your generation is unique and distinctive? And all four generations, a half to two-thirds said, yes, our generation is unique and distinctive. So that's not an unusual thought. Uh, and then we asked why, and uh, the millennials, uh, more so than any generation. The Xers uh, cited technology, but t only 12%. By the way, this was an open-ended question. Had we asked this in a closed-ended way, those numbers would have gone way up. But this was unprompted. T fully 24% said something about technology is what makes our generation unique. You see the silence they talk about their, historic, their moment of coming of age, whether World War II or the Depression. And I must say, let me take a pause. Uh, to observe the boomers' definition of their generational identity, uh, work ethic or, and respectful. And to borrow a phrase that's popular now, I look at that as a boomer and I say to myself incredulously, dude, <laughs> you know? <laughs> either, either we've had a big personality change over these last 40 years or there's a whole lot of selective memory going on because, because uh, I, I remember the 60s, at least some of the 60s, and, and I don't think that, that work ethic and respectful were at the top of most people's to-do list. I don't think most people had a to-do list. But, but there you have it. Um, all right, but let's, let's return to the millennials, and clearly they identify. I mean, what's so interesting about technology is technology this little thing that we all now have in our hands, but they are the leading adopters of. So it's their window on the world. It's their window for information. It's their window for entertainment. It, it's, it's the platform for their social lives. And I, in a session this afternoon, we had, we had the great fortune of hearing from Dana Boyd last summer. She's a social anthropologist. And I don't want to steal her thunder, but she made the point to us, and it just made little light bulbs go off. You know, teenagers and 20-somethings, need to be where other teenagers and 20-somethings are. And way back in the distant mist of history before the digital revolution, that place was the suburban mall or, or the soda shop or something like that. Now that place is Facebook. They need to be there because everybody else is there. So it's fused not just into their generational identity, but into their, into their social lives. And it, it, it's a very important uh, item in their lives. Uh, and you see it here, you know, in, in terms of social networking profile where fully three quarters have one, uh, and that's a, obviously a much greater share uh, than is the case with older generations. Uh, the, the, um, the social, the, the, the digital world allows this generation, well, allows all of us, but for, for most of us, it's a profound and somewhat disorienting change. The idea that everybody can get on a cyber soapbox and say, here's who I am, here's what I'm doing right now, if, you, if you're interested, here's what I was doing yesterday, here's a <laughs> video of what I did yesterday. We, we, everybody really has the ability to share their lives with everybody they want to share it with. It raises interesting privacy issues, I think, we'll, and, and, and norms around privacy that I think we'll discover later. But it has been dubbed by people more clever than me. The, because of this power, the look at me generation, they take it for granted that everybody wants to look at them and they have the power to be looked at. And what's interesting is that in this generation, those behaviors are not only, they exhibit those behaviors not only online with, with the ability to do it, but offline as well. And for this generation, as something of a generational badge are tattoos and piercings, perhaps in the way that long hair was uh, for those of us uh, who grew up in the 60s. But the tattoo numbers, there they are, 38% uh, of this generation has a tattoo, have a tattoo, and for most, one is not enough. Just to dig a little deeper here with some more numbers, 50% of those who have tattoos have two to six, and 18% have, uh, I'm sorry, two to five, and 18% have six or more. Piercings in a place other than the earlobe, 23% piercing in a place other than the earlobe. Uh, on privacy, uh, uh, of those tattoos, of those millennial tattoos, 70% are typically hidden beneath clothing. Take it for what you will. Uh, so we've talked a lot about how these folks are different, these young adults are different. Let's talk a little bit about how they're similar. Here is a classic we gave folks uh, 
seven or eight things, say, look, uh, here are big important things in a lot of people's lives. Tell us, are these, you know, what are the most important things in your life? And rank them or, or tell us which ones are the most important, next most important. So here's the list we got, and it's a pretty familiar list, as I'll show you. Well, I can, I can leap forward to it. So here's the millennials, and it's, um, it's, it's parenthood and marriage on top of career success, helping others and other things. If you look at the same list and you compare how 18 to 29 year olds and 30 and above answered those questions, there's almost no variance whatsoever. So in terms of life priorities, they are in the same place. But then let's, then let's look at behaviors. Uh, how many of this generation are currently married? 21%. And again, if you project backwards in time and look at the same stage of life for Xers and Boomers, twice as many of their, their parents' generation was married at this stage in life, and more than half of, in effect, their grandparents' generation. So they're not, they value marriage, they are not rushing to the altar. And then in terms of parenthood, of course, there has been a social revolution uh, on the linkage between marriage and parenthood that these numbers express. In 2007, the last year, we had 40% of all births were to single mothers. That was that's basically quadruple uh, the figure that was uh, pertained in, in uh, 1970. This has been a gradual change over those 40 years. Uh, the millennials are part of that change. The millennials, more so than any generation, didn't grow up. Uh, only six, six in 10 grew up with both parents. So broken homes, never formed home, reformed homes, it, it's part of their life experience. And judging from this, they are repeating that pattern, perhaps even more so. Um, oh, all right, uh, the, the, getting near the end here. Uh, open to change. Uh, clearly, uh, their, their political behaviors, their big support for Barack Obama and his message of change suggest that they, they very much are open to change. But this battery of questions also tries to look at their attitudes towards changing uh, cultural and, and social and family values. We asked all generations, you think these, these newer forms uh, are, are good or bad for society? And I'm only showing you the millennials' responses here. Uh, and they are, in every case, they are more receptive to these newer modes of family arrangements and parenting arrangements than, we're, than our older adults. Uh, that doesn't mean they are approving of them. And interestingly, on single, what is it, single mothers raising children, the majority are disapproving. Only 6% say this is a good thing, 60% a bad thing, and about a third say, uh, you know, neither good nor bad. But, but in all cases, they are, they are more uh, uh, approving uh, and more receptive to change. They are more receptive to immigration. They are more receptive to interracial dating, et cetera, uh, et cetera. Uh, let, me, let me close. Uh, I think where Judy closed, I, I too am the father of a parent of three minor Xers, or I guess my youngest is a, uh, uh, is a uh, millennial, and I'm, uh, I'm, like you, very fond of this generation. And reading these numbers in many ways made me fonder. They really are an interesting group. Here was something that, that kind of uh, uh, teed up our interest in this. Uh, back in 1969, at, at the height of the kind of age-based social conflicts of the 1960s, Gallup asked what was the generation gap question. Is there, you think there's a big gap, generation gap between young and old? And Gallup found then 74% of all girls said, yeah, there's a big generation gap. We asked the exact same question last year, and to our shock, we found the number hadn't gone down. If anything, it had gone up slightly, 79%. So what is this about? And we've asked a body of questions since then to try to tease this out. And what we, in sum, what we find is, this is yes, this is a gap, but it's not a war. And it's a much gentler generation gap. And I won't run you through all the numbers, but on all sorts of fronts, uh, what we find is that younger adults, these, these younger adults, are respectful of their parents and, and their grandparents. They, we ask them, when we ask them, you know, what's the source of this gap, they all talk about technology. They all say, and also we have different moral values. Young and old alike say that. And then we ask them, well, whose moral values are better? And the younger adults agree with the older adults that it's the older adults' moral values that are better. It's hard for me to imagine 40 years ago the boomers saying, ah, yeah, we're sort of different from our parents, and they sort of had it right, and we sort of had it wrong. We ask them, we ask them, we ask adults of all ages, when you were growing up, did you have a lot of fights with mom and dad? Uh, and uh, the, the, the young adults in this age group had about half the number of fights, as they report, than the older adults report they had with their parents when they were growing up. We asked them about 
uh, about family responsibilities. Uh, they clearly see the family in whatever way it either was never formed in the first place, it got broken, it's been recombined. They see the family as the ultimate social safety net. They are living that reality right now in a bad economy. One in eight of them in their 20s has moved back in with mom and dad because they can't find a job. Uh, and mom and dad, for a lot of them, now that they're adults, are, are, are not just parents, they're actually buddies. They, they actually do get along. And when you ask them about grandma, and when you ask them, you know, if, if grandma is in a situation where she may need to move in with the family, is that a family responsibility to take in an elderly parent who wants to move in? The younger adults are much more likely than the older adults or the elderly themselves to say, yes, it's a family responsibility. We're actually coming out with a report uh, next week or next month uh, on the quiet revolution that's going on, the multi-generational family, which went straight down for the decade, uh, the, the entire 20th century, is staging a quiet revival. These kids are a part of it. It's likely that they're going to be a part of it going forward. So, uh, uh, and, and finally, when we asked everybody again, uh, yes, there's a generation gap, but people really don't see that there's generational conflict. Indeed, among all sort of social groups we asked about, uh, the fewest see there are social conflicts. So, so to sum up, um, this, is, this is a generation that uh, I think by any, all empirical evidence has been dealt a lousy hand. Uh, they've got a bad economy. Their family situation started broken, became broken, got recombined, whatever. The political system is looking pretty dysfunctional these days. There are mountains of debt that we're piling on this generation. We sort of all know those, those stories. So what are they doing in response? Well, in some ways, it's what they're not doing. Are they protesting in the streets? No. Are, are they taking over the dean's office? No. They're hanging out on Facebook with their friends. They're in school preparing for careers that it's not clear that the economy will deliver unto them. Uh, and they're looking forward to a brighter future. And um, if, you, if you read the cover of the Atlantic magazine, you will, hear, you will see that there are a lot of economists who worry that this jobless recovery is going to last a long time. And it will have a lingering effect on these kids in terms of their earnings and their careers for 10, 15, 20 years. That was the case in the early 80s. It may be the case more. These kids are not worried about that. They're putting one foot in front of another. And what they are not doing, what they are not doing is pointing fingers at their elders and saying, you know, this is a pretty unholy mess you've given us. What they are doing is putting one foot in front of another and saying, we're going to get on with it because it's our future. There you have it. Great, great. A lot uh, to chew over there, and I encourage everybody here to read the full uh, survey, the full report, because there's so much material there that, that Paul has very deftly uh, woven together for us to... to I want to come to you first, because you really are the, the person more than anybody in the country, as I said earlier, who has studied generations, and especially this one. Paul touched on this uh, at several points, but what are some of the main ways this younger generation is different from boomer, boomers when we were younger, Gen X when they were younger, and the others? Uh, thank, thank you, Judy. I, uh, first of all, I just want to thank Pew for doing this study. Uh, uh, for those of us who have been talking about generations for a long time, it's great to have you know, all of you come out and talk about a generation. Uh, social scientists talk about the cohort effect all the time, but they don't often uh, talk about entire generations. If it's, can you pass me just a, sure. I'm tethered here and I can't, can't move. Um, <laughs> someone wired me up so I can't move. Hold, hold on one second. Um, thank you. Um, and as well that uh, you use the name Millennial Generation, which is, um, uh, I recall it was in the late 1980s when Bill and I were writing our first book, Generations, the History of America's Future, which is sort of a generational biography of America going back to the, to the uh, uh, 17th century. And we were wondering about what to name the 14th generation, uh, and we were coming up with different names. And uh, Bill said, well, you know, the first one of them is coming along in 1982. They're going to be the high school class of 2000. And I bet you ABC and all these <laughs> networks are going to have big shows about the high school class of 2000. What do you say we name them millennials? <laughs> so anyway, that's how the name, that's how the name was invented um, uh, once upon a time. I think it was around 1980. Uh, we made some predictions at that time about about millennials that no one believed. Uh, we said that due to their location in history, 
uh, this generation, by the time it became teenagers, would, uh, would cause a huge decline in many of the measures of social pathology associated with youth. We said that the crime rate would go down, uh, teen abortion, teen, teen pregnancy, uh, 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 some of the most dangerous measures of drug use would go down. And indeed, I think that was kind of amazing that by the late 1990s and shortly after the year 2000, we saw all of those indicators shift. And I think that's one of the things to keep in mind about millennials. Um, uh, they may say that the boomers have all these values and these boomers are, are so much more moral people than they were. But it's just remembering that when boomers were coming of age, we had 17 uninterrupted years of declining SAT scores, rising drug use, rising teen pregnancy, rising suicide, rising rates of self-inflicted accidents, rising crime. Of that crime, the share that was violent was rising. Basically, everything moved in that direction. Millennials have been moving most of these indicators in the opposite direction, and that's truly remarkable. Um, I think to answer your question, Judy, just about what makes them different, you have to talk first. This is true of any generation. You have to talk about location and history. Location and history is what shapes a generation. And I think it's very useful to think about that period from the mid-1960s, maybe all the way to the early 1980s, the consciousness revolution, what some historians call America's fourth or fifth great awakening, um, uh, uh, what Francis Fukuyama calls the great disruption uh, in American culture over recent decades. That was a period where each generation locates itself in a different way. Boomers came of age into adulthood during that period. And that's when we acquired our reputation for reshaping values, reshaping the culture. Uh, uh, you know, the, we, we were the counterculture. Uh, we were consciousness three. We were the greening of America. We were all of those things. And now that we're in midlife, we still think that all values revolve around ourselves. So, you know, back then, any discussion of values back in the 1970s was a discussion about college kids. Uh, older people back then apparently didn't have any values. <laughs> we never talked about them. And today, most discussions of values today are about midlife people. It's a red zone, blue zone, uh, it's culture wars, it's boomers arguing with each other. So boomers always go through their life telling other generations what's good and what's bad, what's right and what's wrong. That's just, that's how they're wired. But that was the result of that location in history. Generation X were the children of that period. And that hugely influenced them. They were the throwaway kids, the latchkey uh, and, and self-care guide kids. And they grew up at a time when childhood was, when children were basically not wanted uh, they, they're also the lowest result of the lowest fertility rate in American history. <laughs> fertility rate reached its all-time low around the time of Watergate to 1974. Uh, and they grew up at a time when ch childhood was devalued. I don't know if you recall all the Childless Devil horror movies of the 1970s. You know, Rosemary's Baby and Omen and Damien and It's Alive. And, you know, they played to pack theaters back then. That was our image of childhood. <laughs> The millennial generation arrived when the consciousness revolution was over. And I think that is how you define its location in history. Boomers remember it coming of age. Xers remember it as children. Millennials don't remember it at all. So Woodstock is an SOL, SOL qu question to millennials today. It's as remote, remote from them as talk about the New Deal is from a boomer like myself. Uh, they don't remember it. They don't remember anything associated with it in their own lives. And in fact, when they came along was precisely a time at which childhood was revalued again in America. Um, this was a period, the early 80s, when suddenly things began improving for children. Uh, alcohol consumption per capita among all Americans has been gradually declining since about 1981. Drug use among all all Americans have been gradually declining. The abortion rate, the divorce rate have all been gradually declining. Um, I don't know if you recall the early 1980s, it was the year of the yuppie, finally getting to settling down. It was family values, it was cocooning. Uh, in 1982, when the first millennials were born, we saw the appearance of baby on board bumper stickers all across America. Right? We'd never seen that before. And suddenly, all those childless devil movies, no one wanted to watch them. It was all these cuddly baby movies. You remember Baby Boom and Parenthood and Three Men and a Baby started coming out. 
Um, and then about 10 years later, there were, you know, happy movies about adolescence, movies like Sleepless in Seattle and, and uh, uh, Searching for Bobby Fischer. And today, in fact, a very common kind of movie, you see this all the time, these are kids who basically inspired their parents to become better people. Um, and you see this especially now when you have later wave millennials with exer parents. A typical plot line now is, you know, millennial kid puts exer dad into rehab or something like that. I mean, it's just, we're used to that today. Um, at the same time this happened, uh, this, this new image of childhood, uh, came a new protection of children. And this is important to remember. Things like child abuse and what was in their Halloween bags and bicycle, you know, uh, helmets and protective playground materials, all of this became into fashion. Um, fathers present at the birth of their children, even in the late 1970s, only about 20%. By the late 1980s, thanks to the, thanks to the Lamaze movement, about 65%. Today, it's over 70%. Um, uh, uh, so these were, these were huge shifts. The entire, entire home protection industry, all those gadgets you put on your plugs and your stoves and so on, that was a self-made, those are self-made devices back in the 1970s. It's incredible to remember. Parents just kind of made those themselves. That became a multi-billion dollar industry by the late 1980s. So all these things to began to shift. And, and when, when parents couldn't protect kids personally, they started deputizing government to step in. The last 25 years have seen one of the great child protection movements in American history. Uh, every bit as big as what happened during the progressive era in the first two decades of the 20th century uh, uh, under you know, Roosevelt and Taft. Um, you, you think of all of the laws now even named after millennials, you know, like uh, uh, Megan laws, or there's now a code Adam, you know, some kid is lost in a Walmart, bam, all the doors shut, no one gets in or out <laughs> until that one child is found. But we're, we're very used to this now, throughout our society and culture, this new protection. And, and let me use that as a way to kind of get in the payoff, I think, of what you were asking. So, so what are the basic ways that it, it really differs, this new location in history? Um, one is the sense of specialness. They're special. They're special in the eyes of the media, politicians, their community, and above all, their parents. These, these kids have been raised with, with William and Martha Sears' attachment parenting. You know, they, 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 the parents are always around. And we've looked at a lot of surveys comparing uh, parents actually saying, you know, are, do I spend more time with my kid than when, you know, than my parents spent, spent with me? Back in the 1980s, those surveys showed that parents generally said, uh, no, I don't spend as much time. Today, decisively, particularly with parents of the younger millennials, they say overwhelmingly, I spend much more time with my kids than my own parents spent with me. So, I mean, that's an indicator of what's going on. Um, uh, teachers, K through 12 teachers, according to the last six years of the MetLife survey, say that parents are their number one professional problem, okay? These, <laughs> these parents are in their face constantly. And one, one of the things I do when I talk to groups about dealing with parents is you can't straight on them. You can't say to these parents, get out of here, I'm the professional. You've just made your worst enemy if you do that, okay? They the fear and loathing and hatred in that parent. What you have to do, you have to channel the energy. You have to basically say, okay, together we're going to raise this great child. I'm going to do this, and you're going to do that, and together we'll get You have to partner it. This is what colleges are now doing, these huge elaborate freshman orientations. They pass out the teddy bears, and all those boomers are crying, you know? Um, <laughs> Some institutions really get it. I don't know if you've seen recently the, uh, the U.S. Army recruiting slogan. You've seen those ads, right, with the parents and kids that are looking at their careers together. But the slogan really gets it. Uh, you made them strong, we'll make them Army strong, right, which is perfect. It's the partnership. And you see this. And now the new message is for employers. Uh, get used to, you know, meet the parent of, the, of these. <laughs> There's going to be a bring your parent to work week. It's coming. And they're on the phone with their parents anyway, so you might as well just meet them. Um, and they're, they're telling their kids things about they should get benefits and make sure you get a pension plan and, you know, stay there for the long term and all that. So they're, they're cheerleading for the kids. Anyway, get to know them. But that's one thing that's specialist. The other thing is the sheltering. And the sheltering is huge. They're aware, and, and you see, for Xers had a mixed feelings about sheltering. 
because with an Xer, you shelter them, and they two thoughts came to their mind. First of all, they would ask, "Well, why do I trust you to shelter me?" You know, <laughs> it's that natural skepticism. You know, what's your real agenda here? <laughs> and the other thing is. What's the message here? I can't take care of myself? You know, that's kind of the extra response. You know, I'm not tough enough. You know, what's going on? The millennials have no problem with sheltering. Uh, the millennial response is, I get it. I'm special. You want to protect me. I mean, <laughs> what, what's, what's, what's the matter here? I don't, I don't have any problem with that. Um, so sheltering is big, and, and you see that in every institution dealing with young people. Sheltering? sheltering. What, is it? Uh, what do you mean, what is it? Protecting, providing for. Uh, pro providing protections for kids. In other words, um, uh, uh, all of these laws and rules and regulations, just look at graduated license laws now in most states where you have to go through this elaborate procedure. Okay, now two and a half people plus a dog can be in your car while you're driving. Next month it'll be something else. Um, uh, another huge trend, and, and I won't spend much time, is the confidence, and I think you covered that. The incredible confidence of this generation. It's causing them in the midst of the recession not just to take the first jobs that gives them cash, but to say, no, I've got longer term goals. I'm going to live at home. I'm going to go to school. I'm, you know, I'm not giving up that longer term dream. One huge difference, and this is something that we pay a lot of attention to in this generation, and that is. Um, this ethic of teamwork and community. Um, and you see this most dramatically in what they spend most of their time thinking about and doing, which is their technology. Um, and, and I want to just touch on that because I think it's so important. People all often ask the question, how does technology shape a generation? Uh, and that's an interesting question, but it's usually the wrong question. The much more interesting and fruitful question is, how does a genera generation shape technology? Much more interesting question. Because if you look at that, you see who invented the personal computers and why. Well, it was Bill Gates and Steve Jobs in the late 70s, early 80s. Why? Because they wanted to get away from those huge mainframe IBMs that had been designed by their GI generation parents. The idea was that all the information went to the top of an information uh, an organizational pyramid. Someone crunched the data, and then all the orders went down right throughout the organization. Boomers said, no, we each want an individual think station on our own desk, separate from anyone else, so we can be personally creative. And that was the whole 1984 won't be like 1984 ads, you remember in the 1980s, and Apple and, and everything taking off. Gen X took this theme of individualizing and individuating the technology further with the internet, particularly with web commerce and everything they did. But here's the surprise, and here's the real trend breaker. Millennials are taking this technology, and, and to everyone's surprise, when they were growing up, you know, when, when they were growing up, they came home, and the first thing they wanted to do on the computer was, well, they wanted to email their friend, and then they wanted to go in the chat room, and then it was IM, and then it was Facebook and MySpace, and now it's these cell phones which have a little marauder's map. You can tr track every single one of your buddies all day, 24-7. But the point is, they're moving technology back to the community. And in fact, they're revitalizing and galvanizing political campaigns and community action through technology. This was not designed or anticipated by older people. This was driven by young people. And you see this in, in, in hugely higher rates of community service and volunteering. I mean, let's face it, for Gen X, vo volunteering was a punishment. <laughs> you know, you did something wrong in college, you do community service. And the, the Gen X would say, why me of all people? You know? um, but the millennials, it's more of a norm. And so that is huge. And, and, and maybe just one last thing to comment on is, is, is how conventional this generation is. Conventional in a very important way, and it often surprises boomers. Um, you ask them what they want to do as they get older, and they say, they have very conventional answers. They say, I want to have a balanced life. I want to be a good citizen and a good neighbor. Uh, according to the UCLA freshman poll, an unprecedented share say they want to get married and have kids eventually, uh, much higher than it was for boomers. Um, you ask them how they want to spend their time, and they say, I want to spend time with my parents. And it gets back to this whole uh, re revitalization of the extended family which is going on today. Um, and, and, and even their attitudes toward, toward issues like, uh, like, like 
like gay marriage and, and uh, uh, minorities getting along, along with each other is very much driven by this sense that we should all be, we should all have a place, we should all have a family, we should all be brought into the mainstream. There's a complete absence of the stigmatizing that goes on so often with boomers. And I think in that sense, that underlying that is a great sense of conventionality. They want to take things and make them conventional so that we can all celebrate them, we can all enjoy them, and everyone can fit in and have a place that way. No one has to shock anyone, you know, like boomers were constantly doing at the same age. Neil, I let you go on a long time because everybody can see he is just a gold mine of, uh, of history and information about this generation and just some wonderful context that you gave us. David, I want to come to you. I mean, how do you explain, and this, this picks up both on what Paul and Neil were saying, Given the severity of this recession, this economy, where does this optimism, this confidence that things are going to be all right for this generation, what's your understanding of that? Where does that come from? That's a good question. I, uh, I suspect if you look at the trend over time, the fact that um, young people have always been more optimistic than folks who are older, that suggests that there's something simply about being young that makes you more optimistic, um, which is, given the dismal state of the economic climate, um, probably a refreshing thing. I mean, I spend a lot of time with millennials since I um, am a college professor, so these are the people sitting in the seats in front of me. And I certainly see this, uh, a high level of optimism. Um, and I think it goes back to this individualized sense, this personalized sense of this generation that uh, they're sort of you know, all the, the trends that uh, Neil was describing, this is a generation that uh, has had lots of things provided for them in an environment that's been supportive and such, that this is a generation that's been taught that you really can accomplish anything. I mean, I see that in the students that, uh, that I speak with all the time, that they always have 17 internships lined up and they have all sorts of ambitions and such, because from, you know, knee-high to grasshopper, that's the world they've been raised in, that they have been told the world is your oyster, go out and do whatever you want. So and that's like, in spite of the economy. Yeah, so it's not like they feel the rug has been pulled out from under them because of the economy. And the, the what is it, 37 percent, Paul said, don't have a job. Now, again, so I think part of that is just youthful optimism that you would find at any point in time, but I do suspect, and again, if you look at that graph we saw, the, the gap between older and younger and and optimism is a little higher now than it has been in the past. That's probably because of this environment in which today's young people have been raised. Allison, I'm going to ask you to pick up on, on young people and faith. Again, this is something Paul talked about. But how does the fact that they are less attached to a traditional religion, uh, and yet, it, you know, that's, that's not, it's not just a purely black and white picture there. I mean, they pray more. I gather, than, than other generations did when they were young. Uh, fill, fill in some of the blanks there about young people and their faith and their connection to organized religion. Well, you're right that this is a very nuanced picture that we see here. Um, by some key measures, for example, affiliation and attendance, um, young people are uh, a little bit less religious than those who are older than they are, in some cases significantly less religious. Um, they uh, they are also less likely to, to say that religion is important to them. But when we look at measures of belief, for example, belief in an afterlife or um, belief in heaven and hell or miracles, angels and demons, young people believe in these things just as much as their elders do, and in some cases even more. But um, as Andy touched on in the beginning, there are several ways to look at this. We can look at these age differences at this point in time, but we can also look at what other generations looked like when they were a similar age. And as Judy pointed out, prayer is an excellent example of this. Um, young people today, the rate at which they pray is lower than that of older people today. But when you look at these older people when they were young, for example, Generation X in the 1990s or baby boomers in the 1970s, you see them praying at almost exactly the same rate. So there are some aspects of religiosity um, that are not entirely generational, but that results from the tendency for people to place greater emphasis on religion as they get older. Um, 
And so we, we can kind of see that young people may be a little bit less attached to religious institutions, but that this by no means indicates that they are more secular, that for them, faith, they may be navigating it in different ways and, and coming at it from different angles, thinking about it differently than previous generations. There's also, if I remember correctly, uh, a stronger interest uh, than perhaps one would expect in some of the evangelical uh, faiths. Is that, am I correct about that? Help enlighten us a little bit about how they're choosing among the different uh, religions that are available to them. Um, you know, our data for this report don't speak exactly to that, but there has been quite a bit of work done in um, looking at how millennials choose and how, or how young people you know decide what what they how they sort of put together a pastiche of beliefs and that they are much more open to choosing um, finding a set of beliefs in different places um, that th more likely than previous generations to to sort of tinker and put together these these different sets of beliefs rather than necessarily subscribing to one religion overall um, in terms of evangelical or not, I, I think one thing that stands out to me that I think is very interesting is that, you know, we can talk about millennials um, as a whole, as a generation compared to older generations, but even the millennial generation, um, there are, are big differences within that generation according to religious affiliation, that those who are evangelical um, do tend to register much higher levels of religious commitment on many of these items than do um, those who are not affiliated with a faith, for example, and even those who um, belong to mainline Protestant faiths um, or to the Catholic faith. Excuse me, can I speak to that? Sure. Um, so on the specific question of whether millennials as a generation are attracted to evangelical Protestantism as a, uh, as a, you know, a segment of the, of the religious marketplace. That was the case up until about 20 years ago, that young people were being attracted into evangelical ranks. Um, and so if you look over the long haul from you know, the 60s to the 70s, you do see a slight increase in the overall percentage of Americans who were <coughs> evangelicals, but much of that growth was concentrated among young people. That, however, ceased to be the case. That is not the case over the last 10 or 15 years. You um, have seen evangelical churches sort of you know, remain on the American landscape, and anyone who's been to the Saddleback Church in California or the Willow Creek Church in Chicago, these are massive megachurches, will know what I mean. But as, in terms of um, the evangelicals attracting the millennials, that does not seem to be the case. It's not that millennials are, are you know, streaming out of these churches, but they're not being attracted to them the way that young people were in the past. And what that suggests is that there's, a, there's an opening in the religious marketplace here, that there's a group of people that you know, the Pew reports have described quite uh, nicely uh, who are young, um, they're not comfortable with formal religion, but it doesn't mean that they're truly secular, um, they just haven't found a religious home yet. That suggests to me that there's an opening for religious entrepreneurs to somehow reach that segment of the population. They haven't yet done so, and evangelicalism as it exists today does not seem to be reaching them. Okay. I want to jump around a little bit because one thing that keeps coming back to me, Mark Lopez, is the diversity, the enormous diversity of this generation, more diverse than any generation. And we heard the statistics a minute ago, how many are, uh, uh, are Hispanic? Uh, was it 17 percent of this generation? 19 percent. It's jumped to 19 yes. just in the last few <laughs> years. Growing. And growing. And, and growing. Talk about how that shapes who they are and what they think as a generation. Well, first on the diversity, there's a tremendous amount of diversity uh, among young people. Young people are more likely to be diverse, as Paul pointed out, than older uh, generations. And to give you an example, when we talk about people who are of school age or school, school children today, uh, about 20 percent, one in five, are Hispanic. And as Paul pointed out, among newborns, one in four are Hispanic. At the Pew Hispanic Center, we predict that by 2050, about 30 percent of the U.S. population will be Hispanic. So when we talk about moving forward, we're going to see a lot of demographic change coming from Hispanics. But one of the interesting things about that is, is that when you look at growth in the Hispanic population, a lot of that growth in the last decade has actually come from native-born Hispanics. Immigration plays a large role still, but actually more growth in the Hispanic population has come from the native-born. And when we talk about young people, young Latinos, we're talking about young Latinos who are actually, uh, two-thirds of them, 
are U.S. born. So much of the experience that they're having is actually going to be a U.S. experience, not necessarily an immigrant experience, yet they themselves, about 40 percent of young, young Latinos, are the children themselves of immigrants. One, at least one of their parents is an immigrant. So when we talk about young people, diversity is a big part of this. Now, what are young Latinos like? Because uh, clearly they're playing a large role in, in defining this, this, this generation of young people. And much of what has been mentioned today, I think Latinos are playing a part in that. For example, when we talk about how youth vote, when you take a look at the youth vote in 2004 and in 2008, you'll notice that, that non-white youth tended to vote differently than their white counterparts. And as the youth population becomes more and more diverse, I think you're going to see a, a, a continued sort of difference in how they vote compared to other groups. Young Latinos, for example, um, voted overwhelmingly for Obama, just as young African Americans did. Uh, young whites did vote for uh, Barack Obama, but not to the same degree that you see among uh, young Latinos and uh, young African Americans. A couple of other things about young Latinos that make them distinct. They're also, just like all young people, very optimistic about the future. They see the future. They see themselves as doing better than their parents. They put a lot of faith and a lot of value in hard work and in education. And so just like other young people, they are, uh, they're optimistic. And I think that you're going to see that they're going to, that they're, that they're going to, uh, that they see themselves as being successful, or, or at least the future will be successful for them. Yet at the same time, they face a lot of challenges. When we talk about some of those challenges, you'll notice, for example, young Latinos are more likely to be high school dropouts than, uh, than other young people. Young Latinos, uh, even though they place a high value in education, many of them are not in college. And part of the reason they give is because they themselves um, uh, have to support their families. To say supporting their families is one of the key reasons why they're not in college. And when you talk about teen pregnancy, young Latinas are actually uh, the ones who are most likely to be teen mothers by the age of 19, about one in four, compared to other uh, groups of young people. So on the, uh, when we talk about Latinos, we certainly see that, yes, uh, much of the growing diversity of America is coming from the Hispanic population, is going to be coming from the Hispanic population in the United States. Uh, but uh, to a large extent, young Latinos face many challenges in a, uh, 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 that, uh, that in some sense distinguish them from other groups of young people. I want to ask uh, whether it's Neil or Paul just to talk about how that diversity is shaping their view of the world, their view of each other, uh, politics and the rest. Well, I, I think Neil said it very well. Uh, they want everybody to have a place at the table. Uh, it, it, it's baked into their value system, it's baked into the way they were raised, and it's baked into literally and figuratively who they are. The, the diversity that those of us our age look at and we say, we kind of look and say, huh, America really is changing. For them, it's not changing. It's the way America always has been. So it, it's taken as a given uh, that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know it, one of the most fascinating, I think we have this in our report. <laughs> if you look at interracial dating, and, and, and we've been asking this question for 40 or more years, we and other organizations, well, the whole country has come from a place where the idea of interracial uh, dating uh, or marriage was not only a, a social taboo, it was a legal taboo. Every generation has marched north uh, over the last 40 years on acceptance of that. But every successive generation starts at a higher place, and the millennials start at the highest place of all. It's taken as a given that that is part of who we are. And then look at our president today, uh, a product of an interracial marriage. And, we actually have a big report out there uh, about African-American views, about, about the whole idea of race, the idea of race and ethnicity, which is actually terribly confusing. It's confusing, as we discovered, to a lot of Latinos who don't quite, you know, I'm, uh, am I white, am I black, am I a race, am I an ethnicity? And frankly, I don't think our classification schemes have caught up with the realities on the ground, but ultimately the realities on the ground will, will change the language. Um, <clears throat> when when Gen X was young, I mean, coming of age in the 80s and 90s, uh, one figure of speech used a lot was the idea of a, of a multiracial, multicultural society, suggesting a bunch of discrete races and ethnicities that sort of pulled a little bit in different directions. And that was also an era where, in the commercial culture, you saw, it of, saw a lot of what we used to call salt and pepper ads, you know. <laughs> People are kids of sort of very different races together. You know, you show a few blacks with whites and so on. And that's how we, we describe this multi-racial or multi-ethnic society. I think that's really shifting now. I think for millennials, there's much more the idea of simply a transracial, a trans-ethnic society in which people represent all gradations. Uh, typically now in the commercial culture, you see ads showing people of 
undefinable ethnicities, hues that you don't know where, you know, <laughs> where that comes from. Uh, and I think this reflects the difference in the millennial sensibility. A uh, rising number of them, when it comes to census questionnaires, don't want to answer. You know, the census forces you to say, I'm, I'm a this or a that. They, they're really bothered by that. They don't want to answer it. There, there's even uh, some resistance that, that some millennials have talked to me about, about the way um, uh, 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 a sort of a multiracial and multi-ethnic training is done in corporations, you know, where there's sort of a where people are forced to confront, you know, a lot of the animosity between races and ethnicities. And a lot of the millennials say, why does it have to be so hateful? You know, why, <laughs> why, why does it all this have to be so unpleasant? You know, you have to drag us through all this stuff. You know, we're cool with what goes on here. We, we don't want all of that bad news and those bad vibes. And, and I think in that sense, and, and what, what truly comes across in the, in the Pew Report which I find really kind of stunning is the fact that despite the fact that boomers find it so easy to diss younger people, you know, they don't have work values, they're superficial, they have, don't have an attention span and they're entitled and they, you know, go on and on, all these things. Every generation, though, agrees that this generation is more racially and ethnically tolerant. That is, that is some, that's the only thing that all generations agree <coughs> on when it comes to a positive trait among today's millennials. I want to come to the audience, and as I do, just think about what you want to ask uh, the panel. But as I do, just David, quickly, because there's so much to talk about here, we don't, we don't have time to cover everything, is, is this question of increased civic engagement. Neil talked about how the, the great contrast with Generation X. What underlies that desire to give to the community? And, and maybe if it's connected, the belief in government, a surprising positive view of government. Well, I think it's fair to say that uh, the millennials have kind of a complex view of government. On the one hand, um, we do see evidence, obviously, that they're a heavily democratic group and that they're happy to call themselves liberals and they're happy to trust government. But at the same time, we don't see them participating much in um, formal avenues of politics. But we do see a lot of action, um, as has been described, in community volunteering, which has a different implication for how you think change happens. If you think change happens by changing laws and policies, then you're more likely to be engaged in campaigns and you're more likely to be speaking to elected officials. If you think that change occurs because at a very localized level, people get together and run a soup kitchen and they're not worrying about what policies led to the need for the creation of that soup kitchen, but they're just volunteering for the soup kitchen, that gives you a very different way of thinking about the way politics works or the way society improves itself or the way society solves its problems. The millennials definitely fall into the camp of a group of people who see change as coming from small groups of people getting together to do things. Now I say all of that in a very rosy, optimistic, aren't the millennials great kind of tone. And I do actually think there is a lot of merit to all of the community service and volunteering that you find among this generation. But we should not forget that at the same time, many of these kids are doing this because they know that that's the credential they need in order to get into a good college or in order, once they're in college, to get a good job or to get placed in a good medical school or a good graduate program and that sort of thing. And I know in my uh, conversations with students, we'll often have a debate over just how virtuous we should think volunteering to be. And it's often the young people themselves pushing back on me saying, well, I don't really know how virtuous this stuff seems to me because don't people just do it because they feel they have to. In some cases, they're required. And even if they're not required, there's this heavy social expectation that this is what good kids do in order to be accepted into college or get a good job or whatever. And I actually disagree with that. I think that um, you could, it's very difficult to unpack motivations. And if one of your motivations is, I'm going to do this because it enables me to put a line on my resume, and another motivation is I want to do it because I really do care about the people in the soup kitchen, I think the fact that they're in the soup kitchen working is important. And the fact that there is that cultural expectation is probably, on balance, a positive thing. The, the very fact, too, that they actually want to uh, win credentials from big institutions and win the approval of older people by saying they did these That's things. That's a good point. 
makes them very different from boomers. I mean, our attitude was doing something just to put it on your resume, you know. Uh, no way. I'm not going to do that for you. Um, so, I mean, that whole attitude to saying, I want to please these institutions. You know, I want to do the right thing. I want it all down on this big resume, you know, uh, says something about their approach. I hope the transcript notes the uh, hands. Yeah. I want to see how the transcript shows uh, the gesture that, uh, that Neil had.